Okay, let's get started. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Josh Bongard, the instructor for CS228. For how many of you is this your first class of the semester? A few. Okay, it's my first class, so apologies if it takes me a while to get going here. Um, what we're going to do this morning is mostly logistical details, um, how this course will be run, um, what expectations you can all have for myself and the TA, and what expe expectations the instructor and the TA uh, will have for you. We might get to some of the fun stuff, um, but I want to just make sure we're all on the same page this morning. So first off, obviously we're here in Rowell 118. Um, as I already mentioned, I'm a morning person. Not all of you may be morning people, but please do try and be here uh, at 8.30. My experience has been that people that come regularly to class tend to be successful in this class. So I will see you Tuesday and Thursday mornings here uh, at 8.30. Um, my office is over in the brand new Innovation Hall in the central campus in E428. I will have my office hours Mondays 3 to 4 and Thursdays 10 to 11. Uh, the teaching assistant for the course this semester is Caitlin Grasso. Uh, Caitlin, can you put up your hand there in the back? That's Caitlin. And you can find her uh, just outside her office, which is E434. It's a bay of offices for the grad students just outside that bay. There's some tables set up in the hallway. Uh, you can find Caitlin there Mondays 10 to 11 uh, or Wednesdays uh, 1 to 2. Okay, as I mentioned, we're going to do a little bit of uh, logistics this morning, but I can't resist getting to the fun stuff. Uh, you notice Caitlin and I brought in a couple of boxes uh, this morning. So we're going to end class five minutes early today, and you're each going to be assigned a leap motion device that looks like this. Um, when you get your leap motion device, it sits on your desk, and when it's working, and let's hope it's working this morning, it's able to capture or interpret the 3D positions of all the major bones in a hand that is placed over the device or both hands that are placed over the device. So the main work for you in this course is going to be starting here, which is capturing real-time 3D data about the hand and carrying out a series of 10 weekly programming projects where you're gradually going to build more and more code around this device. That'll take us through the first 10 weeks of the course and you will have the remaining four or so weeks to take that code base and turn it into an educational system that will teach a user uh, how to sign the first 10 digits in the American Sign Language language in ASL. That's the main bulk of this course. Okay, what you're watching here is a demonstration app that comes with the device and the interface of this device has been designed pretty well or for this application has been designed pretty well. Whoever designed this knew a little bit about human computer interaction and the very way that this uh, demonstration is presented to you gives you a hint or gives you a series of clues about how the leap motion device works. What are some of those clues? Yes. Um, you. Um, it's optical in some way, like you can see where you're moving. It's not necessarily. Absolutely, right? So you can see that there are camera images. There are two of them. Um, so in the leap motion device, there are two infrared uh, cameras that are pointed upward, and they're using the infrared data that they get back from the reflected infrared light to take that data and infer, uh, actually you're seeing the infrared information in both images, you can see it's grayscale, so it's telling you some information about the infrared. It's taking that infrared data and running some machine learning to translate that into the 3D positions in the, uh, in, of the bones in the hand. So that's the starting point. You get to use the 3D data from the human hand to gradually produce this educational software to teach someone ASL. That's the basic idea. We'll talk more about the leap motion device uh, shortly. As I mentioned, we'll end class, uh, we'll end class early and I will, uh, Caitlin and I will sign out 
a leap motion device to each of you. There are 51 of you here this morning, so I think we have a leap motion device uh, for everybody. We run this like a car rental agency. You check out your leap motion device, and on the last class of the semester, you'll bring back your leap motion device and check it back in. Um, we have a few new leap motion devices. We have some from previous years. Your first homework when you get home is to plug it in and test the visualizer demo. If it's not working, obviously it's not you, it's the device. Bring it back and we'll give you, we'll give you a fresh one. All good? Okay, so um, one other fun item for this morning. Uh, I just took this picture yesterday, as I mentioned, in brand new Innovation Hall. Some of you may or may not have made it over there uh, yet. Can everybody read this text in the back? No? If I make it a little bit bigger, you might not be able to see the bottom. For the back row, is it better? Is that better? Not really? Okay. You don't need to read the text for now. Most important thing is to notice that this is the, uh, what you see when you enter the main hall in Innovation Hall, and it lists what you can find on the first floor, second floor, third floor, and fourth floor. What's wrong with this sign? <laughs> upside down. It's upside down. How? What, what do you mean by upside down? Uh, the first floor should be on the top. The first floor should be at the top of this list, right? How many people agree with that statement? If you enter a building, you usually want to read from the first floor down to the top floor of the building. It's getting a little confusing. Question, comment? No. You don't, you disagree, right? So it's not unanimous. We could probably take a poll. Some people would say yes, some people would say no. For those that feel this sign is wrong, it's wrong because it's upside down. Why did the person who created this sign do it that way? It's convention to read from top to bottom, right? If there's a lot of information here, for those that create, for the, those that created these signs, when you create text, in this case, not by writing it, by putting in these individual signs, in English at least, you start from the top and work your way to the bottom. When you enter a physical building, you enter on the first floor, right? So your first experience with the building is the first floor. Your first experience when you read the sign is to read from top to bottom. So not surprisingly, you have the first level at the top. But for some people, it's a little bit off-putting because it's, it's spatially wrong, right? The vertical positions of the signs do not match the ver vertical positions of the rooms or departments that are listed in this sign. Right? So we're already now in HCI territory. We're talking a little bit about matching the information in the sign with people's expectations. Right? When you enter a building, you enter on the first floor. When you read a block of text, you typically start from the top and work your way to the bottom. So there's a little bit of human psychology behind deciding which way you want to order the information on this slide. There's a little bit of human culture in here as well, because this is written in English with the assumption that most people that are reading this sign are comfortable with English, and because it's English, you tend to start from the top and work to the bottom. So we could have an HCI meeting and decide whether we want to reorder this sign uh, or not. Hopefully, after you've taken a few of these classes and you're walking around campus, you will view the campus through the eyes of a, an HCI designer. Okay, so we'll come back to, to that, but just to give you a taste of sort of the kinds of things we're gonna look at in this course. Okay, two important documents um, in this course, the syllabus and the schedule, you can find both through Blackboard. I wanna just very quickly go through uh, the syllabus so we're all literally on the same page. Those in the back, can you read that? Okay, all right, so uh, we've gone through all that information. There's a little blurb about the course uh, overview here. Uh, in this course, we're gonna spend quite a bit of time talking about how to go about designing user interfaces. How do we design the sign for Innovation Hall? We could have a meeting and decide, are we gonna do things top first floor to top floor or top floor to first floor? We talk a little bit about, about implementation, but not too much. This is not a software engineering course. There is a software engineering course here at UVM, that course tends to focus a lot on implementation. 
We're not going to focus too much on that here. We are going to spend a fair bit of time talking about uh, evaluation. Next time you're in Innovation Hall and you're down in the main hall, watch new students coming in and looking at that sign. Are they confused? How many seconds do they stand in front of that sign before they figure out where they need to go? You could actually spend a morning standing next to that sign in Innovation and do a user evaluation of how well that sign is working. Maybe you put another sign somewhere else in the building that's ordered in the opposite order. Have someone else stand over there and record the average number of seconds that students spend looking at that sign before they go off to their class. And you'll know, if you get enough student traffic, which of those two signs is the right one. We'll talk a fair bit about how to go about doing those kinds of user evaluations. We'll spend a little bit of time talking about laptops and desktops and smartphones, but not too much. We're going to spend a lot more time talking about more exotic uh, electronic equipment that is interacting with users in real time, and those devices are embedded out there in the world. And the Leap Motion device that you just saw is one example of that kind of, the kind of technology we'll be talking about uh, in this class. Okay, uh, so we'll talk a fair bit about design, uh, human factors, how do you think about the, the human user in the loop while you're designing user uh, interfaces. We'll spend a little bit of time talking about uh, cognitive psychology, what do people expect when they approach a sign in a building or a piece of technology. We'll talk about uh, robotics, embedded devices, wearable technologies. We'll talk about cybernetic implants towards the end of the course. What do all these technologies have in common when we go about designing them so that they work well with and for people? Okay. As I mentioned, this also includes a significant uh, project. Okay. Um, no laptops and smartphones in this class unless you've talked to me uh, and you have an exception for that. This is obvi obviously a controversial uh, topic. You can go and read some research papers and growing evidence suggests that you will absorb more from this class if you're looking at me and looking at the overhead slides and annotating things with pen and paper. Okay. Course objectives, here's what I hope you get out of uh, the course. To gain an understanding for how to go about designing interactive uh, systems. In a few years from now, we won't be using Leap Motion in this class. We'll be using something else. Technologies come and go pretty quickly. But what I hope you absorb is good ways to go about thinking about how to design those technologies well before they're actually deployed to a large user base. Uh, hopefully you gain an appreciation and understanding for the challenges and, implic and implications of putting people first. We've got a lot of powerful technology out there at the moment, both software and hardware. One of the major errors that tends to occur is software engineers and user interface designers focus on what the technology can do rather than what people would like it to do or what people would like it not to do. Uh, you go, you'll be doing a lot of coding around the Leap Motion device, so you'll gain a lot of practical experience with designing and actually creating your own interactive system. Um, and hopefully gain an appreciation for the likely future of continuous and ubiquitous human-machine interaction. So uh, machine, human-machine interaction is already ubiquitous. Most of you probably have one of these in your pockets. And even though you don't have a laptop on your desk, your phone may buzz from time to time. And you may know what that buzzing is about. So you all may be communicating with your machines over the next 70 minutes. It's out there. And it's also continuous, right? From sunup to sundown, most of us, for better or for worse, are interacting with different kinds of technology. There's more of it on the way. Our interactions are going to become more continuous and more ubiquitous. The likely future, who knows, right? It's impossible to predict where technology will go and how our interactions with that technology will play out. But hopefully, uh, throughout this course, you'll gain an understanding and be able to contribute to deploying designing and deploying technology to create positive, continuous, and ubiquitous interactions. OK, 
uh, nitty gritty details here. There's no required textbook uh, for the course. However, there is assigned reading and we'll talk about that in a moment. They're all PDFs and they're all pinned to the schedule. So no need to, to pick up a book. Um, most of the readings will come from an HCI textbook. So if you are interested, you can pick up uh, Designing User Interface, sixth edition. There will also be some readings drawn from uh, a book that I co-authored with Roel Pfeiffer a few years ago. Um, thanks to the wonders of modern publishing, uh, for each of you that buys a book, I, made a, I make exactly one dollar. So if all of you buy a copy of my book, I will become wealthy by fifty-one dollars. So there is no financial incentive for me to convince you to buy my book. If you do decide, that's wonderful. It's optional. Okay. Um, I tape each lecture and post it to YouTube immediately after class. Uh, you can go and watch all of the lectures uh, from last year, if you like, and also from 2016. I think they're all uh, up there. So as I mentioned, it's usually a good idea to make it to class. If you can't make it to class, you should be able to watch the YouTube taping of class uh, later, that, later that day. Okay. Uh, I post a version of the lecture slides online before class on Blackboard. So um, for those of you that prefer pen and paper, you can print out the lecture slides, bring them to class, and annotate them as we go along. That's fine. Or uh, you can wait and watch or rewatch the video later today and annotate the slides online if you're more comfortable doing online annotations. But again, my experience is that students that annotate or follow the slides along with us together here in class or after by following the YouTube video tend to, tend to do well in this class. Okay. Uh, at the end of each day, at 11.59 p.m. tonight, there is a quiz. So every day that we have a lecture, there's a quiz. So after class, I will go back to my office and I will set the quiz on Blackboard. It should be available around 11 or noon today. So you'll have between 11 and noon and 11.59 tonight to do the quiz. If you come to class and uh, you do the reading, the, the quiz should take you about three or four minutes. Very, very short. It's just, again, a gentle prod to make sure that you keep up with the lecture material and the reading material. Hopefully it's not too, too onerous. Okay, uh, a few notes about software. As I mentioned, this is a programming intensive course. We're gonna be doing everything in Python. Uh, how many of you are not too comfortable with Python? That's okay if you're not. I suggest you go and take an online tutorial now before your other classes get busy. Uh, I like the Code Academy online tutorial, but there's obviously plenty of them uh, out there. There are also pointers in the programming projects themselves to specific Python concepts you'll need to know for this class, and those pointers point to online tutorials. So hopefully we can all get up to speed and start coding uh, relatively quickly. Uh, in addition to Python, we will be uh, gradually incorporating several Python packages in as we go. Uh, the three main ones are Pygame, NumPy, and Scikit-Learn. Pygame is a real-time drawing program, and you can already guess what we're going to use that for. You're going to be taking the 3D coordinates from the hand that are given to you by the Leap Motion device, and you're going to be drawing that in real time to a drawing window using Pygame. Uh, next week, or possibly the week after, we'll start, make, start using NumPy, which stands for Numerical Python. Um, we're going to gradually start to use more and more data in this class. You're going to be collecting data in the form of 3D coordinates from your own hand. And NumPy is a package that allows you to package data into vectors and matrices and manipulate them in those vectors and matrices uh, in a, an efficient manner. So if you're not familiar with NumPy, go find an online tutorial and teach yourself the basics of NumPy. Um, later in the course, I think the second half, we're gonna start to use Scikit-Learn. How many people have come across Scikit-Learn before? Probably less than half. Okay, that's fine. So uh, Scikit-Learn is a learning package. So inside Scikit-Learn are a large number of machine learning algorithms. 
and we're going to be use, applying some of those machine learning algorithms to the data you collect about the sign that your user is trying to sign over the device. And we'll talk more about scikit-learn and the machine learning aspect of this course a little bit later on. So I just wanted to call those out to you um, in case you're not familiar with those packages and you want to uh, read ahead. Okay, grading. Um, participation counts for 5% in this course. At the beginning of class, I will pass around an attendance sheet. So just write your name on the attendance sheet and pass it to the person next to you and I will collect that at the end of class. If you get to class late, no problem, just come up to the front at the end of class and make sure your name's on the uh, attendance sheet. As I met, again, this is just a gentle prod to make sure you try to make it to class because in my experience, students that come to class are successful. Okay, I already talked about the daily quizzes. We have uh, each daily quiz on Blackboard will be uh, worth 1% of your grade. We have more than 30 lectures, so I will take the 30x percent uh, at the end and compress it back down to 30 percent. So each quiz is worth a little less than 1 percent. We have these 10 weekly programming projects. Each one is worth 5 percent. As you can obviously see, this is sort of the bulk of your grade. So do make sure to stay on top of the programming projects. The programming projects are cumulative, like a math class. So if you don't complete, uh, if you don't complete deliverable I, you're going to have to complete deliverable I in the next week at the same time as you're also writing and completing deliverable I plus one. You can't fall behind because they're deliverables, uh, because they're cumulative. So do make sure you stay on top of, of those projects. Okay, um, these three interim videos are actually part of the final project. We'll talk about those at the end of the 10th week when we finished all the 10 deliverables and we'll talk more about the final project then. So far so good, any questions? No, okay. Um, how many of you are taking this class for graduate credit? Oh, quite a few of you. Okay, so uh, we will talk about that. Um, obviously, there are going to be higher expectations on those of you taking it for graduate credit, and that higher expectation is going to come to bear in the final project where you're going to be doing some extensive user testing. Everyone else who's taking this class for undergraduate credit, you're going to be doing a little bit of user testing, but not nearly as deep as those taking it for graduate credit. So for the first 10 weeks, all of you will be sort of following the same track and we'll talk about user testing at the end of the 10th week. Okay, student responsibilities. Um, if you submit anything late, uh, you're docked 25%, two days, 50%. If it's late for uh, more than two days, you don't need to hand it in. Uh, cooperation. Um, you can cooperate if you want on the deliverables. But I would prefer that that cooperation is light, and I'll leave that up to you to interpret what that means. The reason why is if you allow someone else to do the deliverables for you, you will not understand how the 10 deliverables work. And in the final four weeks, when you go to do your final project, you will have a tool and you won't know how to use it. So obviously it's trivial for you to share code and, and share the code for the deliverables, but I guarantee you, if you don't do them yourselves and understand how they work all the way down to the basement, it's going to be next to impossible to do the final project. So you can work together and work things out. Just make sure that when you hand in your deliverable, you know exactly uh, how it works and that you've written it yourself. Okay. Uh, I already talked about participation. Uh, I expect you to be here, but I don't expect uh, perfect attendance. You can miss up to and including three classes for whatever reasons you need. If you find for some reason that you're missing more than three classes, come and talk to me about it and we'll try and work uh, something out. Okay. Uh, for those of you that have exceptional needs, uh, come and see me and I'm happy to try and make any reasonable accommodations. Okay. Any questions about the syllabus? No? Okay, so let's move on to the schedule. And I will put this up, uh, I will put this up at the beginning of each class. This is obviously a good place to go to, see, to remind yourselves of where we've been, where we are, 
and where we're going. Um, you'll notice that this schedule is broken down into uh, 27 lectures. Some of these lectures take more than one class. And I've tried to group them into one, two, three, four, five themes to help you gain an overall understanding of how this course is structured. First few lectures, not surprising, they're going to be kind of an introduction. What exactly is HCI? Why are we bothering spending a whole semester talking about it and learning about it? We will then spend a fair bit of time in the second uh, section talking about design. So you've got a brand new piece of tech like the Leap Motion device. You're pulling in Pygame and Scikit-Learn and NumPy. There's a gazillion different ways you could put all those components together to create an ASL educational game. What are the right ways to do it and what are the wrong ways to do it, to design that system? We'll spend quite a bit of time talking about that. The way that you decide that a system is good or bad is because it matches the human user's expectation. One of the things you're going to do with the Leap Motion device when we get to the end of November is you're going to take it home for Thanksgiving, plug it into your laptop and put it in front of your family members after your Thanksgiving dinner and say nothing and see if they can figure out how to actually use the device correctly. And I can guarantee you not a lot of them will. They will bring various expectations to this device. If you've never seen this device before, what are your expectations? What do you think it is? A music player, okay. I've also heard cigarette lighter. Well, that one's a little dated now, I guess. A microphone, exactly, right? What is it? People come to technology with various expectations, and at least for new technologies that provide a new way to interact with the technology, the expectations are usually very far from reality. So where are these expectations coming from? We're going to spend four lectures talking about psychology. Obviously, psychology is a vast field. We're going to just touch on a few components of human cognition that bear on interactive technology. OK. After that, we will spend quite a few lectures looking at different sort of case studies where we are looking outward. So we're not looking at traditional desktops and laptops. We're looking at technologies that are sort of out there in the world in some way. They are interacting. We have technology that's interacting with large numbers of people at the same time and trying to coordinate those people to do something useful uh, together. We may be talking about technologies that have new ways of collecting information from human users. Uh, we'll talk about social networking a little bit. Um, we'll do some, uh, some uh, lectures on robotics and embedded devices and how robots and embedded devices may interact in the not too distant future with people. The last four lectures of the course, instead of looking outward, we will look inward. We'll talk about virtual reality, augmented real reality, wearable technologies that sit on the skin, and we'll end the course with talking about technology that sits under the skin, cybernetic implants. Okay. There is no midterm and final exam uh, in this course. Instead, we will use our three hour uh, exam period for you to present your final projects. As I mentioned, there are 51 of you, which means there will be around 51 final project presentations within a three hour period, which means you'll all have about three minutes or maybe two minutes and 30 seconds to present your final project. That takes a little bit of doing, and we'll talk about that more when we get towards the end of the course. OK. Uh, as promised, uh, I've linked in the lecture slides for today and also for uh, Thursday. Remember that I mentioned that we have a quiz, you have a quiz due at 11.59 tonight, 59 PM tonight. Uh, material for that quiz will be drawn from today's lecture slides, CS221. 01 up there, and also from the required reading, but not from the optional reading. So from time to time, I'll post additional material there that's just kind of fun or interesting or additional material on what we've been uh, talking about. Sound good? Okay. Um, 
let's talk about the deliverables now. As I mentioned, there's 10 of them. So if you click on the link here, it will take you to a PDF description of the very first deliverable. And figure one here is to give you an idea of what you will have at the end of deliverable one which is going to be a piece of code that has an infinite loop in it. It's running forever, as long as the code runs. And at every pass through that infinite uh, loop, your leap motion device, if there's a hand over the device, it will capture the 3D coordinates of the hand over the device. It will condition and manipulate that 3D positional data and throw away everything except the X and Y coordinate of the tip of the index finger. And in the Pi game drawing window, there will be a black dot that will move as you move the tip of your index finger. We have the human in the loop. This is a human computer interaction. The human is watching or feeling their own hand move and watching the dot move. And based on what the human observes, they will change the movement of their hand, which will be detected by the device on the next pass through the infinite loop and around and around we go. Okay, that infinite loop which captures information from the device, manipulates it somehow and displays something back to the user, that is the foundation for everything else. You're gonna, the rest of this course beyond deliverable one is gonna basically be elaborations of this infinite loop. We're just gonna be adding more and more things into this infinite loop, but the same logic will apply at every step. Grab information from the device, manipulate the data, draw something to the screen, wait for the user to react, and around and around we go. So far, so good? Okay. Deliverable one is uh, a fair bit longer than most of the other deliverables. Um, I try and break everything down into enumerated steps. So when you come to see me or Caitlin or you send us an email, tell us that in deliverable one, you're stuck on line 23 because dot, dot, dot. Okay. As I mentioned, this one's a little bit longer. There's a total of, okay. 93 steps spread over 12 pages. It's a lot of material, so please start as soon as possible. The other challenge, aside from the length of deliverable one, is you're gonna be doing a fair bit of installation. The first installation is installing the SDK, or the software that allows you to interact with the Leap Motion device. Depending on your, plat your computer platform, some of you may or may not have some installation headaches there. Then you'll be installing Pygame. Depending on your computer platform and your particular version of Python, you may have installation issues there or you may not. If you're lucky and you have the right combination of computer platform and Python version and so on and so forth, it should take you a total of about five minutes to install everything and carry on with the rest of the deliverable. If you have an unlucky combination of platform and Python version and so on, it may take you considerably longer than five minutes. I apologize, I'm not Google. I don't have a thousand employees where I can make sure that everything works for every possible combination of platform and Python and OS version and, and so on. So get started early. As you start to uh, as you start to do the deliverable, it will periodically point you back to this Google spreadsheet. And this Google spreadsheet will ask you, uh, well, first of all, you'll be signing out your Leap Motion device. Then you'll be typing in your platform, whether you got the Leap Motion demonstration app to work. So if you put a yes in here, we know that your computer can talk to Leap Motion and vice versa. Um, everything we're gonna be doing requires Python 2.7. My apologies about that. Uh, most of you probably work in Python 3 these days. You might have to roll back to Python 2.7. Um, can you get Python, Pygame installed and working and so on. So if you're unlucky and you're having installation issues, your first stop is to come back to this spreadsheet, find another student on this list that has the same platform as you and has all of this filled out with yes. 
email your fellow student and ask, how did you get Leap to install on Mac OS 10.14.6? Obviously, Caitlin and I don't span every possible platform and operating system version and Python version, but we've got 51 of us, so we're gonna crowdsource solutions to whatever installation issues crop up in this course. If you're very unlucky and you have some particular combination of platform that no other student in the class has and we're having installation issues and you're working on it and we get to next week when the deliverable is due and you're still having installation headaches, let Caitlin and I know and we will give you an extension on the, the deliverable. Any questions about that? No? Okay. Back to the schedule. Um, each deliverable is assigned on Tuesday morning, which I just did, and it's due the following Monday at 11.59 p.m. So again, please make sure to get started on the deliverable as soon as possible so that you can come and find Caitlin or I during our office hours during the week. If you start on the deliverable Monday afternoon or Monday evening and you have installation headaches at 10 p.m. next Monday night, Caitlin and I are not available to help you. So do make sure to get started on the deliverable, especially for this week because of all the installation challenges that may arise. Okay, last, last, last note about deliverable one. Um, I'm assigning it today, again, so hopefully we can get all the installation issues out of the way and move on to the fun stuff. But also to give you a sense for the pace at which we're gonna be programming from week to week. So you can, I, I'd like you to also use the deliverable to decide whether this course is right for you. If you're a junior and you find that the coding is a little bit uh, at a faster pace than you're comfortable with, you can always withdraw and take this class next year when you're a senior and a little more comfortable with Python programming. A lot of students come to see me in the first week and ask whether this course is right for them. I can't answer that, but you can figure it out by working your way through the first deliverable. Sound good? Okay. Okay, um, let's see. Can I make this window a little bit bigger for you? How's that in the back? Can you see okay? Okay, you don't need to read the text there. As I mentioned, come to class. I made this figure a few years ago. On the horizontal axis here, this is the percent grade for students that took my other class, which is CS206, but I think the same applies for this course. Uh, the horizontal axis ranges from 30% up to 100% for this class. Someone got higher than 100%. I don't know how that happened. Maybe that's a typo. Okay, so each dot here represents a student. The horizontal position of the point represents how well they did uh, in the course. And the vertical axis goes from zero to 20 missed classes. What can you tell me about this visualization? Come to class, exactly, very good, okay. All right, last, last thing I'm gonna say about that. Okay, let's talk about human-computer interaction. As I've already mentioned, we're not really gonna focus on any one computer platform. We're gonna talk about lots of different kinds of technologies. Some worked well and some did not work so well. Not because of any technical flaws, but because of flaws in the assumption about how people would interact with them or how people uh, would like to interact with them. How many of these technologies can you recognize? Most of these are pretty familiar, especially the modern ones. Let's work backwards. What is this? Sorry? It's a PC. What PC? It's one of the first PCs. Anybody know? The Commodore 64. This was my first computer, so that'll date me. How about this computer? It's not the Enigma machine, this is the ENIAC machine which was built around the same time, just at the end of the Second World War and worked on in the first few years after the Second World War. So we have been building computers for 70, 75 plus 
years. And obviously, computers have changed beyond recognition since that time, right? We've gone from warehouse-sized computers down to things like this or things that are this big, right? Lots of physical and technological uh, challenges have been overcome. The way in which people interact with these computers has also changed beyond recognition over the last 75 plus years. You may or may not be able to see in this photo, there's actually a person in the room here interacting with the computer. They're inside the computer, right? Amazing. Okay, PCs obviously pretty familiar. Then we get to smartphones. Uh, I taught this course for the first time in 2007. When I taught that course in 2007, one of my first slides said, imagine when we eventually have computers with interactive touch screens, where you can touch them and have an interaction by touch in real time. That was science fiction in 2007, 12 years ago. Amazing, right? Things are changing so fast in, com in computer science, but particularly in HCI. Okay. Again, we're going to try not to talk too much about existing or old technology, but technologies that are here, like, are just here, like the lead motion device, and other technologies that are almost here, cybernetic implants, uh, robot exoskeletons. Obviously, versions of these are already here, but they're more powerful and more efficient and more user-friendly versions on the way. Think about all the technologies on this slide and the different ways in which people interact with them. Let's talk about leap motion for a moment. How does that differ from all the technologies that came before, at least on this slide? What's different in terms of interaction? You don't actually have to touch anything. You don't have to touch it, right? It's real time, as you saw from the visualization, and so is interaction with a smartphone or, or a tablet. So we've got real-time but touchless interaction in the case of Leap Motion device. How many of you recognize this piece of technology? What is it? Google Glass. Google Glass. Why aren't we all wearing Google Glasses? What, what happened? It's terrible. It, it, was, uh, it, was, it seemed imminent about three or four years ago that this was, this was it. All the rest of this technology was going to go away and everyone was going to have their quote unquote smartphone sitting here on their glasses, right? This was the, rev the, the final step in the revolution. Didn't happen. Why? Why is it terrible? Yes? Privacy. Privacy right? The people wearing Google Glass, obviously they had no problem with it. They had, bought, they had bought it and were using it. It wasn't the users that had a problem with the technology. It was the stakeholders the people not wearing the technology, but were being seen by the camera on the Google Glass, right? You can make the best bug-free, uh, most efficient uh, technology you want. It's got a great user interface. Anyone can wear it, adults, kids, male, female, black, white, doesn't matter. It's great for everyone except those not using the technology. What are, what's an, another example of a technology where it wasn't the users that had a problem with it, but the stakeholders? So I just moved into Innovation Hall. Our lab moved in there, and I was walking past the library. There's a CCTV, CCTV camera on the top of the library. It's probably been there a while. I just never noticed it before, right? Most of the issues about users and stakeholders these days have to do with privacy. Okay, we'll see some others as we go along. How about this technology? What is it? It's a cochlear implant. It's a cochlear implant. I don't know if anyone here actually has one. They're pretty, pretty common uh, these days. It's not a hearing aid. It's not something that is capturing information from outside the human skull and trying to pass it through the outer ear. It is capturing sound waves outside the human skull and then transducing it wirelessly to a device that's on the inside of the human skull. We'll talk about cochlear implants and retinal implants and other implants towards the end uh, of the course. Uh, we'll also spend some time talking about robot exoskeletons at the end of the course. Okay. Um, 
Again, just a reminder, everything for the, uh, for the course is on Blackboard. Okay, let's talk a little bit about um, expectations. So what do I expect from you in class? Obviously feedback, as you've already figured out, lectures are gonna be pretty interactive. Common sense for most things. I already mentioned I don't expect perfect attendance, but do try and be here. Um, it's gonna be a fair bit of work. You've already seen the length of the first deliverable. Most of the work in this course is going to be chugging through the, the deliverables and teaching yourself whatever concepts you don't know when you come across them. Uh, keep up with the class homework assignments. Um, there'll be lots of room for creativity, especially in the final project. Um, at, the end, uh, at the end of this course, we'll have 51 very different ASL educational games. Thinking creatively about how to engage the user in learning ASL, that's a big part of the final project. I've already mentioned self-learning. If you're not familiar with Pygame, um, go find an online tutorial and teach yourself. Okay, obviously a positive attitude goes without saying. Okay, what you cannot expect from either myself or Caitlin is to come to our office hours, show us your code, and show us that it's crashing and asking us where the bug is. You don't know where the bug is, and we don't know where the bug is also. We can't help you debug your code. We can't help you learn Python. We can't help you install most of the software, but we are gonna make an exception this week in terms of deliverable one, as I already mentioned. If you have installation issues, take the error message, type it into Google. If you can't find a solution on Google, see if a fellow student has the same platform and OS combination that you do. Ping that student, see if they can help you out. If they, if they can't uh, help you out, do come and see Caitlin and I. We'll try and get everybody through installing Leap Motion and Pygame. Okay. What you can expect from us, we can't debug your code, but we can help with general programming uh, questions. So we can help you try and find bugs. We can help with general programming principles. Come and see us and we can talk about that. We're gonna use uh, Python dictionaries uh, in this course later on. Obviously, Google a tutorial and learn, uh, learn about it. But if you're unsure about how it applies to the course, sort of conceptual questions, by all means, come and ask us about that after you've tried to Google a solution for yourself. You can uh, especially come to see me to talk about conceptual issues. This is not a very deep class. We're not gonna focus on one concept and drill down into the nitty gritty details of that concept. As you saw from the schedule, we're gonna to touch on a lot of different concepts from a lot of different domains. HCI design, uh, uh, psychology, robotics, uh, medicine as it, rely, as it relates to cybernetic uh, implants. We touch on a lot of different concepts. We're gonna go through them relatively quickly. If you wanna talk about particular concepts in more depth, come and see me and we can do that. As I mentioned, there isn't explicit cooperation in this class. You're working on your deliverables on your own in the final project, but you can help each other out from time to time if you want. If you have any issues with fellow students, come and see me about it. Uh, ask me in class about clarification with anything. Uh, obviously, I've gone through a lot of information today. Most of it is in the lecture slides. It's also gonna be in the taped lecture that you can go back and watch on YouTube. But if I contradict myself in class, at the next class, put up your hand and ask for clarification. I'm always happy to provide it. Okay. You can especially expect an, an emphasis in this class on concepts rather than tools. In this class, we're using Pygame and Leap Motion. In a few years from now, it'll be a completely different set of software and hardware components. Technologies come and go. This is not a class to teach you how to be a Leap Motion developer. It's to take Leap Motion as an example and learn about what works and what doesn't work for the human users when they interact with this new alien technology for the first time. For those of you that have uh, roommates and flatmates, they're gonna be your guinea pigs for this class. Don't show them the Leap Motion device yet. You can spring it on them a little bit uh, later. Okay, so we're gonna try and focus mostly on concepts. And you'll see that also in the quizzes. I'm not gonna ask you about how many infrared cameras there are in the Leap Motion device. It doesn't matter. I'm gonna ask you questions about concepts 
for which the leap motion device or some other technology was the example. Okay, any questions about expectations? All good? Okay, why are we here? Um, there's many reasons why you might want to study HCI. I'm going to talk about three of them now. The first and most obvious one is there's a lot of great job prospects out there. Um, this is a deliberately old slide. This is from about 10 years ago. It's, it's really old, absolutely, it's very old. All right, back in the golden age, uh, software engineer was the number one job you could have in the United States, at least according to CNN money. So take that with a grain uh, of salt. My job was number two. So most of you will go out and get a job in industry that's even better than being a college uh, professor. Okay, this is obviously a little bit tongue in cheek, but software engineer is a great job. And if you love to code, by all means, there are gonna be a lot of great jobs out there uh, for coders. But if you're an HCI designer, not only are there good, good jobs, and well-paying jobs, but often those jobs are intellectually and aesthetically rewarding because you're designing and creating things. It's not just about coding, it's about thinking about people, how they can interact with it, how do you create the visualization for the leap motion device so that people understand what it is and what they can do with it without having to write a paragraph of explanatory text on the screen. Right? So the visualizer demo, there was no, well, little to no English text on there. You figured everything out based on the real-time uh, graphical interface. There was a fair bit of thought that went into the design of that app. For those of you that can do that well and demonstrate it in your final project, package that into a two-minute YouTube video and include that in any job interviews you go out for you will stand a competitive advantage compared to other people who are also good coders, but have little to no experience with HCI design. Okay, that's an obvious reason to take this course. Um, as just an example of that, uh, this was the front page of the New York Times uh, three years ago. And on the front page of the online version, there was a very nice uh, graphic about uh, students going to school out of state. And this graphic was made by uh, Nick Strayer. And Nick took this course, took my course the year before this. So he took this course, graduated from UVM, got a job at the New York Times as an intern, was creating some of these cool graphics, and got roped into creating a graphic for the front page of the New York Times. Not bad, right? Those are the kinds of things that are possible if you absorb a lot of the concepts from this course and can realize them in interesting ways. Okay, why else are we here talking about HCI? Um, obviously, the big data revolution is upon us, right? We collectively as a society, we are drowning in data, but data alone is not useful. It needs to be conditioned, manipulated, compressed, analyzed, filtered, and finally presented to someone or some group that can act on that data. Otherwise, it's useless. So 10, 15 years ago, from my, uh, from my point of view, the big ch technical challenges were how do we go about getting all the data? Some people invented these, which are great data collectors, right? We have lots of data flooding in, the big challenge these days is what to do with all that data. How do we present that data in the right way to the right group who can do something about it? We'll use the lead motion device as a running example throughout this course, the, which, which will be the main hardware demonstration. The, mar the main software demonstrator will be the Gapminder website. How many of you have played around on the Gapminder website? Just a couple of you, great. All right, you're in for a treat. This is one of my favorite websites uh, of all time. Um, Gapminder is a website that has been collecting health and wealth data from most countries around the world for, depending on the country, 10, 20, 30 years. It's a massive data set that they've collected. And they've had a large number of HCI designers that have been building interactive visualizations on the website that allow you to explore in real time the interactions between health and wealth across different countries. 
I love the visualizations in Gapminder. Uh, the new ones look a little bit different from this one. As you can see in this picture, this was taken, I think I took this snapshot around 2006, 2007. I apologize for those of you in the back who might not be able to read the text, but for those of you that are a little, a little closer and can read the text, what is being shown here? So we've got life expectancy in year on the vertical axis going from 25 years to 80 years, which is a health indicator. And on the horizontal axis, we have a wealth indicator, income, uh, income in capita in international dollars or GNP. How wealthy on average is each member of that country going from $1,000 uh, per year up to 40 plus thousand dollars per year. What do the circles represent? Country. How do you know? Yes? Exactly, right? So it's kind of cheating here because I've already tagged two of the countries. It's an obvious clue. If we erase those two tags, you could probably still figure it out, right? What do the colors of the circles represent? Exactly, right? So again, without having to write two or three or four sentences that say the colors of the circles represent which region in the world they're drawn from, the little mini map in the top right there, without having to use an English explanatory text, tells you what the colors represent. What do the size of the circles represent? Population. How do you know that it's population? China's bigger than the US. Absolutely, right? So you already have some information that's available to you, and it's not too hard to figure out that the size of the circle represents population. So the smaller the circle, the bigger the population. Right? And the bigger the circle, the smaller the population. Of course not, right? That's ridiculous. Why? Why is that ridiculous? Why it, do larger circles represent bigger populations? It seems so obvious. Why am I even asking this question? It goes against our usual convention. It goes against our usual convention, right? For most of us, bigger population, although it is a literal thing in the world, it's an abstract concept, right? No one has actually seen the population of China or the United States. It's an abstract concept, big, small population you can see big, small circles. Big population, big circle. It's a metaphor, right? The size of the circle is a metaphor for the size of the population of that country. It's not a verbal metaphor, it's a visual metaphor. Throughout this course, we're gonna see a lot of different kinds of visual metaphors where something on the screen, something you see, represents an abstract concept and the way that you parse or understand the metaphor is going to draw on aspects of cognitive psychology or cultural, uh, cultural assumptions, like the fact that most people looking at this website will know that China has a greater population than the United States. Why is longer life expectancy higher in this graph? Why didn't they plot lower life expectancy going up the vertical axis? It's another convention that most people from the developed world know how to read a graph. Things that are bigger or more or faster or higher or better tend to be up if it's a vertical axis or to the right if it's a horizontal axis and vice versa. Right? So there are actually a lot of assumptions about the observer that are built into this figure that allowed the designer to get away without having to make you watch a five minute YouTube video on how to parse this figure. Okay, as you can see, it's interactive. So in this case, I've clicked on two different countries and have plotted uh, the change in these two health and wealth indicators in these two countries from a particular time period, 1975, up until 2004. What do those two highlighter trajectories tell you about these two countries? Not over 
over time, they're both increasing in life expectancy and health. So they're both, they have something in common. Both citizens are getting healthier and wealthier. That's probably the first thing you take away. What else? There's a lot of information you can pull out of this relatively simple graphic. It seems like the wealth in the United States is increasing more than the wealth of the U.S. is increasing more than the wealth of the Chinese population, which is correct, at least for this time period. But it's a little bit confusing, right, because the horizontal displacement of the red trajectory is larger than the horizontal displacement of the yellow trajectory, which intuitively would suggest that China, Chinese uh, citizens during this period were getting healthier faster than US citizens were. But it's actually not the case. It's actually the other way around. How did you know that? Uh, okay, sorry, you're talking about the, the slope, sorry. I was talking actually, about... I actually got it backwards. Okay, that's all right. All right. That, le that led me to the point I did want to make, though. If you look at the horizontal displacement here and the horizontal displacement here, Chinese citizens are getting healthier, or got more healthy during that period than U.S. citizens. Still You'll notice, some of you, you can read this from the back, it's a logarithmic line on the horizontal axis, right? That's a big assumption about the observer, that the observer knows how to understand, how to analyze information on a logarithmic scale. This is actually a semi-log plot. So we have logarithmic increase on the horizontal axis, but linear increase on the vertical axis. Right? There are actually quite a bit of cognitive demands on the observer in order to read this plot correctly. OK. You'll also notice uh, if we take any one of these trajectories that we hold, have a whole bunch of these circles sitting on top of one another, I've already told you that this is a trajectory over time. Which circle corresponds to 1975 and which to 2004 for China? The nearest one is on the top. The, new, the nearest one is on the top, right? Obviously, this one back here is 1975 because we've tagged it, we've kind of cheated. But the one that is, the, the red circle that is closest to us is the 2004 one. This is drawing on another visual metaphor. What is it? Why isn't this circle occluded, drawn at the same horizontal uh, position, but behind the other circles? Exactly, right? So we're stacking these. They occlude one another, and it has some relationship to time. What is the metaphor, though? What is, it, what is this relationship that's being preserved between the order in which the circles are stacked and time? The, the higher in the stack you are, the more recent you are. Why? Why not the other way around? Maybe like movement that started there. Exactly, right? That cir this circle is, al although this is a 2D plot, obviously, your brain, your vi the visual system in your brain interprets this as being three-dimensionally closer to you than this dot, this circle down here. It's not, obviously, but it kind of feels like that. This, this circle is closer to you than this one. You can probably remember what you had for breakfast this morning, if you had breakfast. What did you have for breakfast yesterday? Same thing. Okay, there you go. Last week, last year, 10 years ago, your breakfast from this morning is closer to you in your memory than your breakfast from 10 years ago, right? So again, it's, it's, now it's a visual metaphor, again, between a visual component, which is occlusion, and something that's very abstract, right? Things that are closer, further away from us in time. There are dozens of visual metaphors like that that are hidden in Gapminder. It's a good HCI game to play, which is to go to the website, play around with it, and see how many of these visual metaphors you can find. OK. Let's get back to why human-computer interaction. Gapminder is great about actually collecting a lot of information and presenting it in a way that lots of people can understand. 
and hopefully make that data actionable. People can go out and use that information to make things better for people out in the world. Here's a different plot for, again, uh, the Chinese population. We have fertility rate now on the horizontal axis, and again, like before, life expectancy on the vertical axis. I know we have some Chinese citizens actually here in the room, so don't give this away if you already know the answer. What is this trajectory showing? Or it's actually showing the result of something. The one-child policy. The one-child policy, okay. Um, as you can see, starting in 1960, uh, the average female uh, Chinese citizen had uh, over three uh, children that increased for a number of years until the one-child policy, and then uh, birth rate started to drop. During that period, you can see that the life expectancy also increased. Great, the one-child policy was successful. It improved the health of the Chinese population, right? Not necessarily. Not necessarily, why not not necessarily? Variables. Sorry? Confounding variables. Confounding variables. Correlation does not imply causation. Right? However, this data set allows you to try and analyze or understand what the one-child policy did and did not do in China. Obviously, it's a complicated issue, but you can start to understand how uh, things are happening by looking at this data. It looks like the circle for China is always the same size. Is it, is the population Definitely the not. Same not quite. It's getting bigger. It's getting is bigger. It might be a trick of the, the projection here. Okay, we'll come back and talk about Gapminder. As promised, I want to finish in five minutes time. So let's just carry on for a moment. We've got five minutes left and then we'll do the leap motion devices. The third reason uh, why you might want to study HCI is obviously technology that interacts with humans continuously and in real time is becoming ubiquitous. It's everywhere. We used to play a game in this class back in 2007, which is guess the number of CPUs in the room. As you can imagine, when we did this in 2007, there were more students than there were CPUs. And you can be absolutely sure that there are now more CPUs in the room uh, than humans. We're cheating a little bit because there's 51 CPUs sitting on the front desk here. I don't think we could even figure out how many CPUs there are in the room now because we've got lots of multi-core machines and so on, right? There are more and more CPUs in more and more different kinds of devices out there in the world, out here in the classroom, and we're not even aware of them. They're kind of blending into the background. So here's my cartoon of the state of the world and where it was and where it's going. We have a whole bunch of H's or humans. Um, in, the not too distant few, in the not too distant past, uh, only a few of them had C's, which are computers, and even fewer of them had cell phones. Now, uh, more people have cell phones than have computers, especially in the developing uh, world. This is a plot from Gapminder. In the interest of time, I'm going to skip over this. This shows how many people had computers in 2006, and on the right, how many people have had cell phones in 2017. Go and have a look at those on Gapminder. It's quite interesting. We now have more and more embedded devices. So in a lot of the, the, more, mo the more modern buildings on campus, there are intelligent light sensors that turn themselves on and off, depending on sensed motion uh, in the room. We have Wi-Fi routers. We have CCT CCTV cameras. A lot of stuff that is stationary, but sensing people and other technologies in their local environments. And slowly but surely, we have drones and robots and maybe autonomous cars that will be joining us in the not too distant future, which, like embedded devices, sense and can interact with things nearby them physically, but they also are capable of self-motion. They move themselves. So we're moving towards a world like this where we have dense connectivity between humans and quote unquote computers. It's not really HCI, it's, we're going to talk about things, uh, technologies much more than just computers. We have lots more of this technology that's out there. It's very diverse. Some of it works better than others. And all those pieces of tech are not only talking to people, but talking to each other. 
How do we as HCI designers ensure that we create a network in which most people are happy with it and use it rather than are not happy and fighting against it? Okay, I think we will stop things there. Before you close up everything on your desk, um, I'd like you to form two lines, one over there, one over here, and Caitlin and I will sign you out a Leap Motion device.